right. Good evening and welcome to your Ann Arbor District Library. Uh, today we have a conversation with Malia Lazu, who's uh, the author of the recent book, From Intention to Impact, A Practical Guide uh, to Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Uh, in the course of this, a couple quick things. If you are in need of hearing assistance devices, there are two on the table just where you came in. If you need the bathroom, if you exit uh, from this space and then turn right, they are directly across from uh, the drinking fountain. Uh, this is being broadcast on our YouTube channel, so we do ask that if you have questions, first of all, that you hold them until the end, uh, and then that you also wait until we pass the microphone to you so that your question can be captured for the audience that's watching uh, on the stream. Uh, and again, uh, without further ado, Malia Lazu. Hello, hello. I'll warm it up. Uh, welcome. Let me introduce Malia so I can say some nice things about her that she may be too humble to say. Um, and I'm first, I'm Ryan Friedrichs, for those who don't know, uh, Ann Arbor native, been 20 years, I grew up in Ann Arbor, then 20 years in Detroit. Um, urban planning now and helping build the new University of Michigan campus in Detroit, the innovation campus. Uh, my nights and weekends, I still do our voter engagement civic work uh, via my wife. I'm married to the Secretary of State, Jocelyn Benson. Uh, we've been fans and friends with Malia for so many years. Um, so it's an honor to welcome her uh, back to Michigan uh, and to talk about her new book. So I guess maybe we start with a little background, your bit of your story, uh, so they can get to know you and some of how that story led you in the direction of this book. Fabulous, thank you. And thank you, everyone. Thanks so much for coming. Um, so I also have to talk about Ryan a little bit because he's gonna be too humble. Um, there's two compliments that I give people very rarely, like very rarely, and that's being an organizer and being an ally. And those are real labels for me, right? They're labels that mean something, right? Um, and Ryan is both. And I have been in rooms with Ryan where he has had to be an ally for me and he does it with the dignity and grace that keeps my dignity and grace. I haven't seen him in. Thank you. <laughs> Thank it's recorded you. now, so <laughs> send it out. No, and, and I have receipts. If anyone wants receipts, you, you call me at Malia Lazu on socials and I will give you those receipts. Um, and Ryan and I haven't seen each other since we were doing voting work. Like it may be 16 years. I believe the last time I saw Ryan, he had a new girlfriend named Jocelyn. <laughs> and they were moving to Detroit and she was this amazing woman. And I was like, yes, Ryan, <laughs> yes. Like, um, and so to see all of this is amazing. Um, and thank you so much for being my conversation partner. Um, so I started off as an organizer. Um, I like to say it first started in my house when I was 13 years old and I called my mother who's white, the blue-eyed white devil, because I was reading the autobiography of Malcolm X, which she bought me, by the way. Um, and I told her we had to self-segregate the house, and she said, great, the rent's due at the first of the month, we'll split it 50-50, and my movement was dead. Um, and I had to, I always say it was my first movement and I had to sell out to the man. Um, but it was obviously in my blood, right? Um, and. I went to college in Boston and started a nonprofit around voting called Mass Vote and went to DC. And this is where I met Ryan and did political work, um, national voting work for several years and really sitting in the culture, right? It, it wasn't about just voting, but it was how do we belong in this space? How do we belong in democracy? And for young people, which we were at the time, um, for people of color, for women, that question isn't as cut and dry as it may be for some others, right? And this idea of how do you participate in voting? How do I motivate people to vote? Um, and we wanted to do it culturally. Um, and we actually got Eminem to do a mixtape. Yes, I remember. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, about voting um, as one example of how we were you know, how we were able to get people excited. And I mean, we were in the Rolling Stones. Like the young Dems are never in Rolling Stone. <laughs> um, and, and we were in Rolling Stone at that point. And I think it that started planting the seeds of the culture work for me, right? Of what it means to be in space. That I don't have to be like you when I'm in space. That I can do voting differently than you do, right? I, you see Puerto Rico, right? I went to Puerto Rico, I was like, oh my God, we can party to the polls. Like, let's do that, right? And again, trying to figure out 
what belonging in democracy looks like. And then I met a man named Harry Belafonte. And for those of you who don't know, he is um, a singer. He was a singer, an actor. Um, he sang the song Deo. He was the first person to sell a million records. Um, and he was this, he did We Are the World. Definitely check out his new movie on Netflix. Um, but he was this incredible race man. Like, he, he was this black man who bought Martin Luther King his house, who paid for Martin Luther King's life insurance so Coretta and the children weren't, you know, destitute because he knew King's, um, would, you know, King's early passing would be inevitable. Um, and he just had this integrity, and, and I, I was blessed enough to work with him for several years. And with that piece of my life, I, I really learned how you stay in integrity. Right? How do you go to these big, powerful places with bells and whistles and stay in integrity? Right? Um, and it's important to do, right? It's important to do to, to be on the right side of history. Um, and then I, got, I became burnt out, as organizers do. Um, and I moved back to Boston and started working with companies that wanted to change the culture of Boston. Um, and that led me to eventually becoming a bank president, long story, we don't have to get in it. <laughs> um, and now I'm, lect I'm a lecturer at MIT and I work with companies and organizations who wanna shift culture, hence the name of my book, From Intention to Impact. So, so we'll pivot to that and I wanted to start with one of the things I love most about Malia and you'll, you've already seen it and felt it is authenticity, right? Feel every word comes from core. And I think one of the things you said right at the beginning, authenticity starts by looking within. And we were just, so I wanna pick up where we naturally went with our conversation before starting, which is about, and it's starting to, to lean into the book, the backlash against DEI, right? And DEI as maybe a parallel to the voting work, the civic and voting engagement work that we did. And um, a, a writer, um, Alex Kesar, who wrote a book called A Right to Vote, years ago, there was finals for the Pulitzer Prize, and he described voting rights not as, it's often described as kind of this slow stairway of progress, but actually it's a pendulum, and it swings, and then it's fought back, and it swings, and it fights back. And so we were talking before you come up here about, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on the parallels of, of, of that pendulum versus staircase model as it comes to DEI. And the moment we're seeing now of the pushback after the leap or lunge forward after the murder of George Floyd, um, love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I think the staircase, I mean, maybe we blame Led Zeppelin, I, I, you know, but it, it's this idea that we're going to some place good and, um, and finite and done when we're up, right? We walk up the staircase, we get to the top of the stair staircase, and we're good. No more racism, no more sexism, no more homophobia. That's just not how it works, right? What's that old saying, evil runs between the heart of every man, right? Not between men. Um, and, and by man, I mean that general, this was a long time ago. <laughs> um, I'm not ma man-hating right now. Um, but the, the idea of a pendulum is more how it works, right? It, it's, it's a natural behavior to, feel abundance, to feel scarcity. It's a natural behavior to follow a leader, right? To follow a narrative. It's a natural behavior to believe you're a good person, believe your country is a good country, right? And so the pendulum swings because we do. And I think what organizers know is that that is gonna happen. So you just try to keep pushing the pendulum as it swings. And when it swings, when you have a moment like George Floyd, you know we have three years, tops. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's get done what we need to get done. And then we go back to the day to day, right? There, there, there's, this isn't amazing grace. You know, I mean, if we could lay hands and have people, Harriet Tubman would have done it. Right, Harriet Tubman, would, Frederick Douglass would have done it. The suffragettes would have done it. Like these were all amazing people who had the stage of their time. Right, like they are the people who we would consider the kings, or maybe people who are being hated in our country right now, who are going to be considered the kings yeah. 20 years from now. Right, um, and so that pendulum swings, and if you think about it as a destination, you're going to miss it, and you're going to remain tone deaf. I 
there's so I want to tease the book. I don't want to give away all the uh, goods in the book. I want everybody to go buy the book. But one of the things out of the gate that you refer to is love, right? You refer to the three L's. The one that jumps off is love to me. But talk about the three L's. And as it, when I think of the book she handed back to me uh, ten dec decade later, is the autobiography of I think it's Gandhi's <laughs> Gandhi. book, right? We're talking about yeah, the talk about love and that that idea of of when you're entering this conversation which can feel uncomfortable to people, can feel scary to people, right? The way she's, that really landed with me as I read the book that felt um, powerful and warm and kind of inviting was the three L's sort of recommendation of a model uh, of how to, how to begin as you're sort of guiding this community, but a corporate also, how, how do you maintain, how do you sustain? So let's talk about the three L's a bit. Thank you. So. First, yes, Ryan loaned me a book like 16 years ago, and he's just getting it back. So, so I, and I feel funny saying that as a library, but look, <laughs> right? Like, isn't that, right? That's good, right? Even 16 years, you can return a book. Um, so um, the three L's, after George Floyd, I got so many calls from people who said, what can I do? What can I do? What can my company do? What can we do? What can we do? And... It was, I was all, if you remember, George Floyd was the latest of a string, right? There was Ahmaud Aubrey, there was Breonna Taylor, like, we were terrorized. And all of a sudden, all of these people wanted to help. And I got pissed. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan's laughing because he knows that's my cycle. I'm like, what? Okay, let's fix it. Um, and I was like, you know, why don't you know, like, what do you, do? hug, <laughs> hug me right now. Like, what do you do? Like, do what you would do to anybody else who's being terrorized in their, in their country. Um, and so then we came up with this training, the three L's. And it really, you know, I, I like to say it's sort of like a intro to any type of cultural learning, right? It, it's, it's a really basic, basic tool, but it can be so effective and we've seen it be effective as we've been using it in, in the businesses since. And the, so the first step is listen. And if you remember, you listen with your mouth shut. Shh. You listen to what black people have been saying for 400 years. Listen to what women have been saying for 400 years. Listen to what immigrants have been saying for 400 years, right? Just listen, listen to their voices. Not interpretations of their voices, not studies of their voices, but listen to their voices. And once you do that, that kind of lets you catch up, right? So you know not to walk into a community that's traumatized and be like, what can I do, right? Like, you'll know that then, because you would have listened, right? You would have heard. And then you go into the community and you learn with them, right? You let them teach you. You think about pedagogy here, right? You let them teach you. You learn from them. And then you have to take action, right? Because once you know, you got to do something. But action isn't good enough, right? We need you to take loving action. And, you know, when I do this in corporations, I always make the joke, like, don't worry, HR, right? Like, <laughs> we're, you know, we're talking about that love that built this country, right? That Philadelphia is named after. Right, that phylos, that brotherly, sisterly, sibling love that makes a society work. That's why it was so important, right? That's why it was part of the Enlightenment, yeah. <laughs> right? This brotherly love, sisterly, sibling love. And so what does that look like, right? That looks like taking action that's relevant to the community. So let's take George Floyd. George Floyd happened, and we saw a whole bunch of what I like to call Wakanda cosplay, <laughs> right? The Congress took a knee with some kente cloth. I don't know how they got that kente cloth so fast. I was like, oh my gosh, like they had it. Like, here you go, everyone throw it on. The CBC was like, put on the kente, put on the kente. <laughs> Jamie Dimon took a knee, put his fist, Jamie Dimon, right. Right. right? Fist in the air. J Colin Kaepernick just got kicked out of, football for doing that, and now we got Jamie Dimon doing it, right? And then we got the Juneteenth holiday. Now, I've been to a lot of black meetings. That was not on the list. 
We weren't asking for that. As a matter of fact, what we were asking for was the George Floyd Police Reform Act. That's what we were asking for. That would have been a loving action. Juneteenth is just the next holiday after George Floyd was killed. That's how that ended up working out. Right, everyone take a breath, stay home. It's okay, black people, stay home. We love you, we're not racist. Here's $100 million, pa, right? Out of that 50 billion that was committed, there's a total of 298 million that actually have receipts that are accounted for, right? So all of those actions that were done, they weren't actually loving action. And so how am I to receive that? Probably not with the love that you hope I receive it with, right? So the three L's gives us a chance to listen and learn from a community that you wanna be in right relationship with so that you can take the loving action, you can take the relevant action. Black Lives Matter didn't need Pepsi hiring Kendall Jenners to, to help out their cause, right? That's not a loving action. If you talk to black people, they would have said, I wouldn't do that <laughs> if I were you, right? Um, and so listening and learning helps you catch up. It helps you catch up with what we don't know about one another because we live in America. You know, one of the stats in here that I was so shocked to find, it was one of these things where I was like, I know a different kind of white person, you know? Like 75% of Americans polled did not have one non-white friend. So not even like a black friend or a Latino, like, any non-white, anything else in the world, right? Any other continent, any, anything else in the world. That's, what does that mean, right? How, how, how do you know to love me? How do you know to be in relationship with me if you've never been in proximity with me? So the three L's allows you to come in, allows you to come in respectfully, and maybe even with a little more confidence that you're not gonna do something tone deaf right off the bat. Um. I love that, uh, and I think starting there and then moving to sort of maybe some of the tragedy of movement building, especially in Detroit, right? Dr. King gave his I Have a Dream speech in Detroit before he gave it in D.C., right? You have- My hell um, tell him, I worked in Detroit, <laughs> tell him our Do it again. <laughs> you have just, just the history of, of civil rights and the place Detroit holds is, is so special. Um, the Liuzzo family, Gail Liuzzo, right? Who, uh, uh, Jocelyn, I knew well from Wayne State, we've become close with. Grace you, Lee Boss. You, you, ha you have movement and what you talk about is the power of decentralization. And I really landed on me the power, you referenced Starfish and the Spider, which some may be aware of, we can, you can talk a bit about that. But I wanted to lift it up a bit because sometimes it feels like when you lose a leader, right? It can feel tragic, a movement can feel lost and there's different movements these days. And what you're recommending here that also landed is how a, a movement can be centralized and very hard to stop then, but also within a movement within a company or within a community, right, can also have those elements. So say a word uh, or two about that. That landed with me a lot. Yeah, so when we talk about how we get to impact, right, with a corporation or an organization, we're talking about behavioral change in a grand scale, right? And not everyone's gonna come along with you. You gotta remember Jesus only had 12 disciples. You know what I mean? Like you can make change with a small, mighty bunch. Um, but you are making a behavioral change. You're not making a policy change. You're not making a process change. Um, and so how, does the, how do societies influence one another, right? And what you see is decentralized structures tend to be the strongest. Starfish and Spider, I highly recommend it. Um, it really lays out the strength of having leader, they call it leaderless organizations. I like to call it leaderful, because like, if no one's a leader, then everyone's a leader. And, and that's sort of the point of decentralization. Um, and the metaphor of starfish and spider is if you cut a spider's head off, it dies. If you cut a starfish, you end up with two starfishes, right? And that's really what you want in movements. And so right now, the way DEI is set up is um, it starts from the top. It's you know um, declared that we have made a commitment, we have signed a pledge, right? Whatever it is, um, and then it's expected to trickle down through management, through middle management, get and then eventually get to the employees. And um, that that's hard to do with things that require behavior change, right? It's a lot easier to do if I can incentivize you, right? Um, but being that DEI is m normally not funded in that same way, yeah. bonuses aren't tied to them in that same way. You have, to, you have to incentivize behavior. 
So how do we get everyone to want to be a company of more belonging? You let anyone who wants to be, yeah. right, who wants to do that with that company become a leader. And so rather than having a CEO push it, you have champions. And anyone can be a champion, right? It could be the office manager who like knows everyone's secrets and you know like knows influences people in that way, right? Um, it could be someone in the mailroom. It, you know, it could be anybody, but someone who's passionate about this can be a champion. And then it also replaces tasks and project managers with catalysts, with people who make things happen, right? And you can again, anyone can do that. Right? I can decide that in my department, I want to see if I can get a book club going. Yeah. Right? And I can do that. Hopefully, I can do that in the company. Right? Employee resource groups are also a great example of starting to decentralize. Right? Giving, your, giving power to employee resource groups is really, really important. I talk about Ralph Lauren in the book. Yeah. You know, I mean, they first of all, they pay their employee resource groups. Um, but secondly, they run everything through them, job descriptions, right? And what ends up happening is they end up getting some inside tracks, right? Like, oh wait, you know, you're hiring, great. I'm going to the Alpha Conference, so I'll see who we can find, right? The community starts working, becomes catalysts for you, becomes champions for you. Um, so those are just a couple of examples of decentralization and, and how to think about applying it, even within a hierarchy. Um, because that's, you know, one of the biggest pushbacks that people get are like, oh, Ryan, what's going on? How long are we doing this for? And if you don't feel yeah. comfortable, you're going to be like, I don't know. I don't get it, right? But if it's, if it's something that I imbibe, I'm going to be like, oh, my God, forever, I hope. <laughs> it, pl planning for that pushback, you talk about that. Expecting it, not being shocked by it. And then we'll get to the seven steps in a minute where, where you understand what the pushback is, right? So it's, it, what's happening there. But I wonder, before you, we get to that, uh, we talked a bit about the, you know, the moral case and kind of the movement case, but there's a corporate case too, right? There's a monetary kind of cut and dry uh, fact. I think it's City, Citibank, Citi's number they put out there. I think it's GDP, correct me if I'm wrong, $16 trillion is lost based on bias and exclusion from people who can't get access to loans to educational access. I it's sort of stunning, right, to be reminded that I think maybe- A material number. Yeah, so to say a bit about that, for, as an incentive, it is it's it is the right business move. That's right. Take the morality out of it, and it is actual right. business sense and it, and a tr at a tremendous level, like a staggering level, almost. Correct, correct. And, you know, this was something that <clears throat> was really important for me to get out in the book. And um, this book is peer-reviewed, and so I actually had- a section, I had a chapter in the book that was called, Are You Greedy or Are You Racist? <laughs> it was edited, it was peer reviewed out? Right, it was, and, and, and it's now a nice little section, so look for it, a little Easter egg for you. Um, but this idea of the benefits of DEI, and I think we think in our heart, oh well it should be moral, you should be doing it because it's the right thing to do. Yet, you don't take any, people don't have those considerations in business. Right? I am of business value. I am valuable to a business. I'm not just a charity case or, oh, we need to do this to make it right. I will actually help your business do better. And I want you to value that so that we can make money together. That's what DEI is. And what we know is that diverse teams are 34% more profitable over 75% more likely to enter a new market successfully. As an ex-bank president, I can tell you those are material numbers. Those are real numbers that can affect my quarterly calls that I gotta be on, right? My earnings calls every quarter, right? So, and those are numbers from Deloitte, from McKinsey. I'm not giving you NAACP stats. These are the business experts saying. And if you think about it, it makes perfect sense. There's very few places in your life that diversity doesn't make something stronger, from revenue streams, to your diet, to your agriculture, to your gardening, right? But then when it comes to this, all of a sudden, oh, well, we don't know if it makes sense. You know, I, I teach at MIT Sloan, and I tell my students, find me a valid study 
that shows a room full of white men has ever done anything more successful than a diverse room would have, right? Like, but yet we have to pull out all these stats. Oh, women-led teams get 21% more patents in Silicon Valley, right? There, eventually you just have to see that diversity works in business like, just like it works in financials. And say a word about your experience as a bank president as well. Community organizer becoming Berkshire Bank, regional president. There's a monetary move they're trying to make to tap into wealth. It's just like you saw with the, you went to Wakanda earlier, right? And it was sort of Hollywood's moment to say, oh my goodness, look at the revenue. Right. Look, at the, look at the dollars, right? So say a bit about that time in your life, which I think was fascinating to make that move from community organizing to, to leading in that moment and kind of a, the case study, or at least how you see it uh, uh, relates to what you just said about the monetary case and where the money is and who, uh, opening new markets and such. Right, right. So the bank that, I, that I've, I was consulting for them for a while and then I was hired was called Berkshire Bank. And if you're familiar with Massachusetts, the Berkshires are the western part or at the western part of Massachusetts. And we were, I mean, as an organizer, it seemed like a lot of money at the time, right? We were a $22 billion bank. I thought I was bawling until I went to like the Bankers Association. And I was like, oh, we're at the kiddie table. Oh, okay. Let's look at Brian Moynihan from afar, um, you know, but... Um, we were from Philly to Maine, so we had a pretty big footprint. Um, and we had grown by buying smaller banks in suburbs, right? So you think about you know, the, the small, your small suburban banks. Um, and that was pretty much it with that growth, right? We had, where the growth was, was in urban centers, right? Where the growth was, was in diverse communities. And so, um, Berkshire Bank understood that if it wanted to grow its deposits, it needed to go to other people. Um, and so the CEO who hired me to do this work, um, in no way I, was a progressive, right. right? I mean, he was an NRA member. Um, and when he hired me, I looked at him and I said, you know I'm unconvinced by American capitalism. <laughs> and he said, we have enough capitalists at the bank. I think we'll be okay. Um, but... It go, again, it goes to show that the, it made business sense to him, right? Like, it, it wasn't something that he came to, um, you know, because of some, some salvation moment, right? It made business sense. Um, and then at the time, we were, so I was a bank president, the Eastern Massachusetts, and, you know, at the time, we were trying to close the racial wealth gap in Massachusetts. An article had come out that, Boston has one of the most severe wealth gaps with the average black family having $8 versus the average white family having $250,000. And so we started looking at home ownership, which is where a lot of that white wealth sits. Um, you know, business ownership, right? Ownership, right? You want to close the wealth gap, you need ownership, right? So we, we started looking at those models and um, we started driving capital to these businesses. And um, it was just an amazing experience because for me, what it showed is if you have a will and if you have your hands on the levers of power, you can just do it, mm -hmm. right? Like, and, you know, I had come from the outside where, you know, I had this bucket of rocks and I'm like leaving them at the door and I'm like, should I bring a rock in? I might need a rock, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, by the way, you can't throw rocks from the inside. The trajectory is from the outside. <laughs> <laughs> I learned that too. Um, but all of a sudden, I was like, oh, wait, I don't have to fight. I just have to deliver, hit my goals, and develop products that are relevant for the people I'm trying to build relationships with. Yeah. And so, you know, I mean, we were the first bank to do non-customer PPP loans because, hmm. well, we could. Yeah. <laughs> right? We, we could. I mean, yes, there was a logic that we want to get the people who have loans to us. Let, get, let's have them get the money so they can pay us the loans back. I get that. I get why you want your customers to also be made whole. But we know that some of the most vulnerable communities were not getting PPP. And we, I knew it as an organizer before it was even launched. Right? I was like, right. I was like people ain't going to use this. <laughs> right? So that, that was the experience. And to be able to just do it. Yeah. Right. And I became friends. You know, I, I like to say like the FDIC, you know, I would call them um, and ask them questions. And it was just really a, a moment for me to understand like, oh, this actually isn't as hard as we're making it. Uh, and speaking of that, as hard as uh, uh, people make it, this I want to talk about the seven steps, but I want to talk about the title first. So for those who haven't seen or intention to impact. So 
because this the, the intention impact is really as we get into some of the the meat of what you're trying to communicate to businesses how do they move from just a bunch of press releases or a bunch of signals to actually you know closing that wealth gap or doing something that is tangibly increasing the lives of black and brown people and so talk a bit about the title how you land on the title and then um, I don't want to you know to the degree you want to tee them up, those sort of seven steps, and what you most kind of want to lift up about where people loop back to step one, right? Because <laughs> yeah. they actually don't make it through, they, they make it to where they, they got what they maybe needed, and they, That's they right. snap back. That's right, that's right. So um, another insight about the book, the original title that I wanted to call it was Evolve or Die, um, and there's now in a chapter called Evolve or Die, um, but th this, I, I there, at first, I started with this sense of urgency. Like, we are in a global economy now, right? Like, I heard something on the BBC, and they said, well, America, a pivotal power. And I felt like that moment that um, Russia must have felt when Barack <laughs> called him a regional power. Like, pivotal? We're Amer America, right? Like, <clears throat> but we are a, in a global economy where a majority of that globe, by tens of percentages, is not white. So if we want to remain competitive, right, we actually have to be able to talk to the rest of the world. The European Enlightenment experiment is kind of, is sunsetting, right? And we will forever hold on to it and be grateful, but it, it's sunsetting, right? And so what is the next thing as other countries and ideas rise? Um, what What is that next thing? And this idea of, die with, you know, it's too dramatic. No one wants to die. Um, and so I then came back and been like, okay, what am I talking about, right? Like, what am I actually trying to say with this book? And what I was trying to say is your intentions are not enough. F your intentions. My grandmother used to say that's how you get to hell, right? The road is paved with them. Impact is what we need right now. We don't even need action. We need action that leads to impact. And so I'm, I love alliteration, and so intention to impact for me was a, a great way to sum up what we have been doing wrong. You know, companies will put out, and this will get me into the stages, you know, companies yeah. will put out a press release for signing a pledge. You, can, you can't do that in earnings. <laughs> we set a goal to make this much more money, right? Like, you actually have to show it, right? But for this, somehow you can just sign a pledge, of, oh, racism is gone, sexism is gone, right? So the, what are the stages to move from intention to impact? I like to say the first three stages are the honeymoon phase, right? Like the first stage is you, you understand you can do something about the problem, right? You sign a pledge, right? You, you, um, you, know, you set a goal as a company, right? The CEO says something. And then everyone gets excited, so then you do something. Oh, we're going to do a training, right? Um, and we're going to make T-shirts, right? Oh, we're going to call this something. Right? And everyone gets excited, and so then you make t-shirts, and you call it something, and you do a training. And then you see that there's low-hanging fruit that you can act on now. Yes, right? Like, we are about to make a hire. Why don't we try to make that person diverse? Brilliant! So then you go off, and the minute you start working on that low-hanging fruit, you get pushed back. Yeah. And that's stage four. And stage four might be someone saying, well, are we gonna hire less qualified people because we need to hire women or because we need to hire people of color, right? You know, I don't think that our headhunters know have diverse networks. I don't, are there black lady engineers, right? These questions start coming up and they're treated as if they're valid, right? They're treated as if it's a valid concern, especially in stage four, right? You're like, oh, well, you know, well, that's too bad, we'll, we'll, we'll try another time, and you get stuck at stage four for hiring, right? Or you say, well, no, we'll, we'll talk to some people, we'll see if we can find some people, and then you go to stage five, right? Because now you're continuing to move the ball to hire this person, right? So then you reach out and you hire people, and, and, and you find people, and they just weren't a culture fit. Sorry, but you know what, we'll, we'll try next time. In stage five, you start realizing, well, why weren't they a culture fit? Why am I a culture fit? Am I a culture fit? Right? And you start realizing <clears throat> this isn't legitimate pushback. This is the culture pushing back against changing itself. Right? Peter Drucker was right when he said culture eats strategy for breakfast. Yeah. 
He was right. This is the culture starting to munch down on your strategy. I don't care how good it is. I do a lot of good strategies, he tells you. He can tell you, I build <laughs> great strategies. I've seen him be chomped up by culture, spit out, right? So, this, so now your culture is starting to chomp at your DEI strategy. And you have to then decide, are you going to push through the pushback? And are you gonna say, actually, actually, you know, most women are overqualified for the positions that they have. So we think we can actually poach some great talent and looking forward to doing it. Right? That's the answer to that question. Are we gonna hire less talented? Why would we ever? Yeah. Right? Why would we ever? The talent is out there. And so we're gonna find it and we're gonna bring it in and we're gonna become a better company because of it. But if you're not confident or maybe don't even believe that yourself, you get stuck in this pushback because you can't actually push through, right? And eventually, you actually have to say, okay, this is sexism, this is racism. And then you have to decide to do it anyway. Yeah. And that's stage seven, you know? And I, there's this great investor, Barbara Clark out of Boston, um, mm. and she, she talks about, she says to men all the time, just write the damn check. You've asked these women questions. I've never heard you ask men, <laughs> right? right? We, ju we just gave someone, you know, the, their last bit of funding within, you know, by something that was written on a napkin. So now this woman who's just come in with projections and all mm -hmm. of that, let's write the chat. Let's, and you have to get to that point where you just do it. And then that's when you will start seeing impact. That's when, that's when someone like myself will actually say, now you're doing the work. Um, I do want to get save room for questions. I'll, I have one or two more, but we'll open it up. So if you have them, just know that. Um, you say, stay curious. I love this. Uh, curiosity is both an entrance and sort of a welcoming sign and maybe lubrication on the gears as you move through what can be scary, right? But curiosity as a theme, I, I, I felt it many times in the book, and you kind of come home with that near the end, too. Talk about curiosity uh, and what you're trying to bring, bring home there. So curiosity, which is not nosiness, and if you want to know the difference, I have an aunt you can sit next to <laughs> at dinner who will tell you all about being nosy. Um, curiosity is wanting to learn from someone while, no, while being nosy is wanting to make a judgment about someone, right? And, and that's really the difference. Um, the Cherokee have curiosity in their values, Will. It's one of their seven values. And I really loved their definition um, of curiosity, which is my life, and I'm horribly paraphrasing, but my life will be better because I'm getting to know you, yeah. right? That everybody has something to offer you that will make your life better in some way, shape, or form. And so it's your job to discover that, right? It's your job to be curious about that. And I think what curiosity, like you said, when you're getting nervous, right? Getting curious about someone um, helps you have a conversation, right? And not, you know, oh my God, what are you, right? Like not that, right. but just being curious about someone the same way you're curious with your friends, right? And you ask them random questions. Um, but knowing that you're doing that because they have something to offer you is the secret sauce. That's the magic. That's the honey, right? Is understanding that everyone has value. And sometimes it's hard, right? And my therapist will tell you that sometimes I'm like, let me tell you the people who don't have value right now. <laughs> but you talk to your therapist about it and you work through it, you talk to your God, you breathe through it, right? Um, but Everyone has value to give to you. And when you're in something like a company, when you're anywhere where there's a power dynamic, I think curiosity, as you said, is the lubricant, right? Curiosity lets you sort of decenter the power dynamic and let people across the table from you know that you're being, that they're being valued. And it's landed on me as self-curiosity as well, where you sort of push the reader in the book to say, what parts of this book made you uncomfortable? And instead of sort of reacting or hiding from that, like lean into that a little bit. Be curious about why that part made you uncomfortable and explore it. And don't think you're gonna land at the right answer right away, but be curious about kind of yourself, which was powerful. That, that so I was gonna say, self, can I ask you self, about, yeah. see now you're about to see ally action take yeah. place, because you're, you're the first white man that I can ask this to in reading that. Yes. Um, 
how did that feel when, when we end the book by saying, like, if you're uncomfortable, good? Lean in. I think it landed uh, as I want to read it again. I want to go back, and I took the notes about what I loved the first time. I want to go back, take the notes about what I didn't love, right? To push the buttons that I, you know, th it's a different experience. And so it was wonderful to hear at the end and say, and it made me say, versus the things that stood out the most, I want to energy and talk to you about, I want to go back for myself and say, okay, where, where are the blind spots? Where am I, where, you know, so it's a second read. Yeah. Second book would be great too, but right. I, you know, <laughs> it's coming soon. But for this one, that, that's how it lands on me is what is that second um, pass through that is not necessarily just a um, best case, which everybody likes to talk about best case, what's worst case? Right. You know, right. Uh, conversations get real, relationships are real when there's conflict, right? Well, and, and so that's in, and internal and external. I try very hard to call in in this yeah, book, right. you know, but yeah. also to call in authentically and honestly, right? Yeah. Like, just because you do a training, you're not going to get a gold star from me. Um, but if you're actually doing the work, right? And so um, finding that balance, and you're the first you're the first white man I could ask on how it felt, <laughs> see? Look at that. Thank you, Ann Arbor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, and I, I, I also, I, I loved the Killer Mike example. You just threw it in there, but it was, you know, how dedicated are you? You think you're dedicated to this? Well, Killer Mike slept on it. What do you say, a park bench? When he didn't want to, you want to buy it for him, but you tell right. a story. It was just, right, it was one right. of those moments where you, I sort of paused and I was like, because right. I've seen him, I've listened to him, I know, you know so much, but I didn't know that story. So Killer Mike, and I think this will be a great story to end, so yeah. if you have questions, sure. get ready. Or if not, Ryan and I can keep yeah, talking forever. Um, so Killer Mike is a rapper who bought a bank and is very much around black empowerment. Um, and so he did this show where he was going to towns and he was only going to black-owned businesses. He was only going to spend his money black. <coughs> and in one of the towns, there was no black-owned hotel or B&B, not Airbnb, I don't think even Airbnb was there then, but there was no black-owned place for him to stay. And so he slept on a park bench. Um, and so, you know, it sort of proved that point, right, of like um, how hard it actually is if you want to support black businesses, um, you know, and if you're that dedicated. Um, and so that when because I, I saw him, I, I watched that episode, and I was like, is he really like, Oh, he's laying down. Like, I wouldn't have laid down. I would have been like, yeah. I'm just going to go to a nice white person and I'll feel good about giving this lovely person my money for a bed. Um, and, but that is really what it takes, right? Um, you know, I, we started this conversation talking about Harry and maybe, you know, I talk about Killer Mike as I talk about Harry too, about this being able to take a stand and this integrity in the work and not capitulating. And I think right now when the when politics are asking us to capitulate like let, let's not get it twisted this isn't a legal question that's why the military still has affirmative action because they we know they need to be ready we know they need to be competitive right so th this is a question about politics and what we have to ask as individuals as organizations as corporations is are we willing to stand in that integrity and get to stage seven or are we gonna cross out words like women and black and LGBTQ that people have fought 400 years to be included? We know who this house was built for. It says in the Constitution, blacks are three-fifths of a people, women aren't even mentioned, and Indians are savages. Those words matter in these, in, in these missions. They matter a lot, and a lot of people died for that. So if we're gonna ask people to vote, because a lot of people died for that, then let's respect terms like women and LGBTQ and black and Latino and Asian and Pacific Islander and indigenous and trans and black trans women, right? Let's celebrate all of it and write it all down. Let's have a whole page of left-handed, red-headed lesbians who like, you know, let's put it all down. Let's help everyone find who they are and then celebrate that. So thank you. Yeah, beloved community. Thank you. Uh, questions? Uh, uh, and there's a microphone. I think we're doing a, a live stream, so feel free to uh, grab a microphone if you guys uh, have a question. Or I'm, I got a few more you can wrap up with. Comments, too. It doesn't have to be a question. Reactions, thoughts? While you ponder, <laughs> I'll give one more for the companies. So this is for the live stream and the, and the space I'm in now, right, where you're trying to you know, deal with ownership. We have a program called Project Destined. Project Destined is about 
teaching young people how to, we tell them buy back the block, show them how. Give them the tools to do it, ownership. Why, understand, and, and what young people come out of it with is kind of an understanding of, well, why is there a liquor store at this corner? Who owns that? Why is it there? What is passive income? I'm curious, when we were first texting about this, or emailing this panel, you talked about real estate and the power of, which is basically ownership, as you just said. Thoughts about what you've seen, and we were talking about Boston, and you're like, there's other, there's corporations, and I've seen progress here, progress there. Real estate is one of those that is kind of the, the a cornerstone one. Curious where, and I think I linked you with a friend, there's a few yeah, people, no, and we're some yeah, success we're, stories, yep, right? Yep, yep. Curious to hear your thoughts on real estate and on ownership and on some of the ideas of yeah. Yeah, yeah, no. Um, so how did I end up in banking, right? Like, if you follow power, I think you're going to end up in one of two places, banking or real estate, right? It's sort of the, the foundation, the critical yeah. foundation for American capitalism, right? Um, some could say our two original sins, right? Um, and what we need to figure out is how do we actually repair um, this notion of ownership in real estate? Right, and I have a black grandfather and a white grandfather, and so I saw after World War II where they were allowed to move, mm -hmm. right? The options that they were allowed to have, and they weren't the same, right? And they ended up not being the same at the end of their lives either, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so this idea of reparative real estate, right? Of us first reckoning with this notion of we're dealing in stolen goods, Right, so we're making millions off of stolen goods. And we're also talking about closing the wealth gap off of stolen goods, right? I mean, it's so embedded that how do we actually make it a reparative process? How do we actually help democratize land ownership, you know? Um, and in Boston, there's so much development happening right now um, that I'm pushing, you know, especially my real estate clients, but also working with the city of Boston and Arthur Jameson. Yeah. Um, you know, and the BPDA to figure out how do we actually try to do development in a way that repairs what was done, you know? Um, and hopefully, you know, there's some, I mean, what you did around community benefits, right? Like, like the, these are these models that get us there, right? It is leveraging those, that power, again, that pendulum, right? It swung there and you right. said, pack it full of community benefits. <laughs> And for those who don't know Arthur Jameson, he was the uh, planning director, housing director in, in Detroit. He's now the uh, planning director in Boston. And some of the ideas with Maurice Cox, who's actually now the planning director in Chicago, uh, they were all in Detroit uh, after the bankruptcy. And some of these ideas that were fascinating to explore around real equity, right, um, that I'd love your thoughts, like community land trusts, right? Uh, the idea community solar, right? Um, my uh, uh, grandpa and my dad's here with my son downstairs, but he loves those ideas. Co-op banking, right? These things that were, you know, f from the earliest days they were building power and equity. A neighborhood REIT, right? A real REIT means a real estate investment trust. Having multiple community members that have an ownership stake as a building goes up or a land trust. Mrs. Jones owns the land. If Meyer is going to build on it, it gets a check in the, in the bank. Right. The models are there. They're innovative if we are interested. That's if right. it's impact, if it's real. That's right? right. That's right. I mean, and I, I mean, I think land trusts, I mean, how long have they been around, right? Like, I mean, Bernie we... Bernie Sanders, we, right? Exactly. his career running on land trusts in Burlington. Yeah. A, exactly, right? I mean, these are models that we know work, and some communities get to use them, right? Some communities get to use them very effectively. Um, you know, there there is this story about, um, I think it's around Jacksonville, around the Jacksonville area, and there was this... Um, real estate developer who um, decided to use covenants for good. Mm. And all of a sudden his investments started drying up. Um, and he eventually couldn't hold, you know, um, whatever the, the um, notes were, right? His debt was come too much. And the folks came to him and they said, we'll bail you out of this, but you need to get up rid of those covenants. Mm. Wow. And he said, no. And those covenants are still there to this day. Um, and thank goodness, be, I mean, the banks ended up working with him. You know, he was able to rework stuff. But um, 
he knew the importance, right, of something like a covenant, right? So I mean, something as basic as that can be used um, um, for good. But I think as far as reparative, again, this idea of land trust, of community ownership, of co-op, not only does it help people have ownership, but then it helps us have buy-in. Right, um, Frederick Douglass. Right, what 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 is the Fourth of July to a slave? Right, um, what wh what is America to people who can't get a piece of it? Yeah. You know, how should I feel I belong here when I I can only rent? Right, why, why why should I feel like I belong here? Why should you ask me to work hard for this country when I know that I'm not going to get as much as others? Right, when I know that my house is not going to be appraised as much. Um, you know, why Why should I have that buy-in then? You know, so I think being able to have people own the land and understand um, how they can be a part of that upside is critical and that we do have the tools. You know, I, I think this is a place where we need to innovate on will, not necessarily on tools. Um, hopes for the book is my last question, so I'll end on this and anybody can go to the mic if you raise your hand if you want to jump in, but your, your hope, your dream when you, when you sat down to write it and you know your debt, how you see success. How do you define success? When will you? I mean, aside from sales, that always helps. <laughs> but getting the word out, which is, uh, and thank you all for being here tonight, taking time to come out. Um, what is your hope uh, for the book? So, my hope for the book is that it gives people a guide to swim and think about this in the safety of their home, mm -hmm. right? Like these are these are issues that can can make you feel uncomfortable and should. You know, if you if you weren't uncomfortable after George Floyd, like I, I don't know what to say, right? Um, the, the, you, we should wrestle with this, right? And um, and so my hope is that people feel the authenticity, that they feel the honesty, but that they feel the love, um, you know, that I have for this country. I'm Black, Puerto Rican, Italian from Honolulu, Hawaii. I'm more American than Apple Pie. <laughs> Amen. Um, and I have a love for this country. I will, Ryan will tell you, I will quote all the founding fathers right along with everybody. Um, you know, I talk about the founding fathers in this book. Yeah. Madison gets a shout out in this book. Mm. Um, you know, I'm, I'm doing this because I know we actually can be the greatest country in the world. Like I do have that hubris about us, but I know we're not there because of our narrative because we believe that, um, that this country is built for certain people and other people have to work to fit in. Yeah. Um, and so please get the book um, online. If you're watching live stream, you, you can order it. Um, but know that it's a safe way to explore this issue um, and, and breathe into it. Well, thank you for being here. It's an honor to be around your energy and your voice and that authenticity, which is so wonderful. Um, and thank you for putting this for the whole world to see. And come back and visit us soon. Yes, please. Right. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.